right. Well, good day and, uh, to everybody and welcome. We're excited to have you join the QCA, How Reliable Is Your Data Session. It's great to have you join us today, and we hope that you and yours are safe and well. My name is James Camareri, Vice President of North American Sales at COPC, and I will serve as today's session host. Nice to be with you. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing my colleague and veteran COPC consultant that will be leading today's event, Brent Jernigan, Director of Consulting. He brings more than 15 years of customer experience management on the outsource and consultancy sides of the industry and is also responsible for leading performance improvement consulting, vendor management engagements, and uh, for the delivery of many of our best practice training classes. We are both glad to be with you here today. As some of you may already be familiar with COPC, I'll just take a quick moment to introduce our organization so that you're a little bit familiar with a, a background of what we do. We are a global consulting firm that's been around since the mid 90s. We are relentlessly focused, as it says here, we're relentlessly focused on creating meaningful customer experiences and optimizing business outcomes. And we do this with a focus on performance improvement, which you're gonna hear a lot about today uh, for those operations that support the customer experience. We developed a performance management uh, system and quality management framework known as the COPCX or customer experience standard, covering best practices and customer experience operations, in in-house and outsource businesses, vendor management organizations, and indirect procurement. Many high-performing organizations follow uh, the standard or compliant with it or even become certified uh, to the COPC standards. To do all of this, next slide please, to do all this, uh, our solutions include customer experience strategy consulting, optimization consulting, training, and of course certification. All of this based on the COPC standard. An example of these directly related to the data reliability top topic that, that we'll be talking about today. You'll notice within CX strategy that we help our clients with benchmarking, which includes research and building centers of excellence. Of course, performance management within customer experience optimization. And uh, within training, uh, we, help our, we help clients uh, train their team members to maintain these improvements on their own through our best practice uh, for customer experience ops, best practice for vendor management organizations. Uh, and you'll hear more about uh, how we use Lean Six, Lean Six Sigma methodology um, today in today's session. So we have specific training available in all of these areas. And then certification, which for some organizations is a way to get their independent assessment of their customer experience operation and to ensure that they are performing optimally year over year. Okay. So a couple, of, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, during the session today, the attendees will be muted, but we'll be able to submit questions. You'll see a little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, our, our agenda will include several polls throughout, uh, six to be exact. So uh, we'll stop from time to time to get your input uh, on some of the items. And we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes after the presentation in which to field your questions. But feel free to submit as we go. And then we'll close it out with that last poll uh, for feedback purposes. So we hope that you'll take a moment to give us some feedback on how we did today. All right, with all that said, I'd like to hand it off to Brent. So Brent, please get us started. Great, thanks, James, um, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, so we're gonna spend the next, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes here talking about QCA, which for most of you probably is a new term unless you've had some experience with COPC in the, in the past. Um, and, so when you think about performance improvement, when you think about the operations, uh, really the foundation of performance improvement or in managing the operations is making sure that you have good data. So, so QCA is something that COPC uh, actually developed going back to, I think it was some data classes that we had in 1996. Uh, so this has been part of COPC's DNA uh, for a couple of decades now. Um, and, it's, and it's really about how do we know how to uh, evaluate the reliability of our performance data? How do we make sure that the data that we have is something that we can use to manage the operations effectively uh, and to make improvements uh, in our processes and our performance? Um, and so when you think about this, you know, we have a ton of data that comes into the, into the operations. Um, we have lots of metrics. We've got lots of performance data. We have multiple systems that we're pulling data from, uh, and all of that stuff should be able to be turned into information, right? 
So it should allow us to actually analyze our, our trends, make really informed business decisions and improve our results. So tracking and analyzing this data is really what's critical to help uh, us stay on track and to know what actions we need to take in order to be able to achieve our goals. Uh, and so we have to ask some basic questions about the data before we can rely on that. Uh, and, and these are really common questions that most organizations should ask themselves, but often in my experience when I go into organizations, um, we're really just making assumptions about these questions instead of confirming whether or not we have answers to them. So are we measuring what we should uh, be measuring? Do we actually have the metrics in place that we need to be able to manage the operations? Is the data accurate? Is it current? Is it reliable? Is it something that we actually know we can rely on to make decisions? Uh, do we have the right targets in place? And ultimately, can we proceed to take action on that data? That's what QCA is all about. So it's, it's a, a systematic way for us to assess the data um, and assess the level of understanding in the organization about the data uh, before we actually start trying to take actions. Because if we don't have good data at the start, then a lot of the actions that we take uh, probably will not have the return on investment that we really want those actions to have. So QCA, if you, if you think about this, is an acronym, and it really stands for five things. So the C of QCA is for collected. Are we gathering the data? Is the data that we're gathering, is it complete? Does it actually, uh, you know, does it, does it have enough data over time for us to, to really understand what's going on? Um, the U in QCA is about usability. So is the data usable? Uh, do we have clearly identified targets? Oftentimes we go into organizations and for some metrics there are no targets uh, or the target may change quite often, uh, which represents its own set of problems. Um, and are the targets set based on high performance benchmarks where that's appropriate? So if we're trying to be a really uh, leading edge company in, in terms of the customer experience, do we have you know, really high performance targets for customer satisfaction, for customer dissatisfaction, for uh, measuring the overall service journey experience, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then in terms of the data, can we de determine whether or not there are trends in performance from the data that we have? Do we have enough data to actually identify whether or not there are trends in performance? Um, the I in QCA is about integrity. So that's, uh, that's really where most people think of the reliability of the data. Um, they oftentimes, they, they miss the C, the U, the K and the A. Most organizations are thinking at least in some degree about the integrity of the data. Really data integrity is, is uh, it's encompassed in this acronym ROAR. So we want our data to ROAR. And what that means is we want the data to be relevant. It's reflecting the, the measures that we intended. Uh, and we want it to be objective. So the method of collecting the data is unbiased. We're not painting a rosy picture when in fact, maybe the performance is, is less promising. Uh, or vice versa. We're not actually suggesting that our performance is awful when in fact it might be acceptable. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we're unbiased and, and we're actually getting an accurate picture of what's going on. Um, accuracy, is it, is it numerically correct? Is it calculated in the right way? Um, and also when we have graphs that show what our performance is, those graphs are not misleading. They don't actually hide variation that exists or create the appearance of, of variation when it doesn't exist. And then finally, uh, the last R in ROAR, representative. Does it actually reflect what's going on in the population of data? And especially where we have uh, sampled data, uh, is that sampled data actually giving us good insights into what's going on in the population? Then the K of, of QCA is really about whether or not the data is known. So is it known and understood by the appropriate staff? Everybody doesn't have to have access to every piece of, of data or every metric that we're measuring, but if it's essential to their job, then they should actually know the level of performance. They should have access to that data. Uh, and that should include the statistical validity of any sample data that we have so that we're not making decisions based on, on movement in data that's really not that statistically relevant. So, so the appropriate people should know the data, they should understand what it represents, uh, and they should especially understand in, in cases of sampled data, how meaningful those results or the changes in the results actually are. Uh, and then finally, the last letter is A, it's about actions. So if we're not consistently hitting the targets, are we actually taking action on the data to improve performance? Uh, and can we show that, that the performance improved as a result of the actions that we took? 
Uh, and oftentimes organizations don't have a way of looking at performance to be able to say whether or not improvement that they're experiencing is meaningful or if it's sustainable. And so we want to have a structured way for looking at the, at the data and understanding whether performance improvements actually reflect changes that we've made in the business that we're able to sustain over time. Um, so we're going to go through each of these one by one. I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to set up e each of these with, uh, with some information at the start, just so you get a sense of what we're really talking about when we're talking about the particular letter in the acronym. And then we'll talk a, a bit about some of the, the drawbacks or the, uh, the gaps that we've experienced in COPC. We've, we've observed in all of the, uh, the audits and the visits that we've made to thousands of contact centers around the world over the course of the last two and a half decades. So we'll start with collected. Uh, so what you're looking at here, uh, for those of us, of us that have experience with, uh, with COPC is uh, something called table F and it's actually just a snippet of table F. Table F is a performance data table that shows how the organization is doing on all the required metrics uh, over a, a particular period of time. In this example, you can see we have, uh, we have 12 months of performance data, um, and, and this is looking at three metrics, although there's a much longer list of metrics you really should be paying attention to. Uh, so we have service level abandonment rate and, and first call resolution. And we've spelled out what type of metric each of these is. So service level and abandonment rate are really about service in the organization, how well we're servicing the customers. First call resolution is really a quality metric. Uh, and you can see we have a target for each of these metrics and we have data. So when we think about collected, what we're really thinking about is, have we gathered the data? And is the data that we've gathered, is it complete? So in looking at, uh, at this really truncated version of table F, we can already see we've got some data that's missing. There are several months where, where we didn't measure something, right? And in this case, it was first call resolution. Um, typically, this is something that we experience. If there's a gap in the data, it may be because the person who's responsible for tracking that, um, I won't say you know, something negative like they got hit by a bus, but maybe they won the lottery and they don't work here anymore. And as a result, we haven't found someone to take that role and continue to collect the data. Sometimes it's a systems issue. Sometimes the system itself doesn't actually give us the data for some reason. There's a technical problem. Um, the IT department may be struggling with something. And as a result, we don't get the data that we necessarily need. The other thing you should think about is, um, you know, some collection issues turn out to be uh, integrity issues as well. And, and so the data is not reported because it might have a, a, an integrity issue or it is reported, but the integrity issue means that, that we can't rely on that. Um, and in addition, there may be situations, as you can see here with abandonment rate, where our target is to be less than 4%, where, uh, where data is reported in whole numbers. We don't know necessarily that these repeated numbers uh, are actually different numbers, or if someone just hand keyed 4% in there. Uh, so in some cases, you might have people who are well-meaning uh, that might copy and paste data just because they don't want there to be gaps in the reporting of the data, but they're just taking previous performance and copying and pasting it into the cells where we weren't able to, to report on the data. So the first step is to look at the data and see, have we actually collected the data? Do we have data? and where we have data, can we see the decimal points? Can we see whether or not that, that performance is changing over time, uh, or does it suggest that there might be some collection issues? So, uh, so common issues that we experience in, in data collection, uh, failure to recognize when the data is not collected. So uh, a lot of organizations we go to when we first visit them, they, they don't have a regular cadence that's established to look at all of the data, all of the metrics that are, are required. And the problem with that, that is uh, oftentimes you don't discover that you don't have the necessary metric in place and the necessary data collected until you actually need to solve a problem. And then when you try to go to the data, you realize, oh, we haven't collected that at all. Uh, and so we don't have anything that we can analyze to help identify the root cause. So we wanna make sure that we have a regular cadence in place uh, so that we can understand what's going on with all of the metrics and make sure that all of the metrics that we may need to analyze in order to be able to manage the business uh, are actually in place and that we actually have that data. Um, some other problems that we experience, roll-ups are provided, but the underlying data is not preserved. So we may see kind of a top level performance for the program, but we actually don't have individual agent level performance or, or you know, the performance data at the transaction level 
so that again, when we try to dig into this data to identify root causes, we don't really have the level of data that we need in order to be able to make meaningful decisions. Um, we can see roll-ups that, uh, that really are kind of uh, at a, a year-to-date level, um, for instance. We don't have trends, so the roll-up data doesn't show us whether we're getting better or worse over time. Uh, we may have trended data, but that data may be trended over a very short time period. Um, I often see programs that are reporting the trends, but they're reporting the trends at the daily or weekly level. Or they might look at the current quarter and they say, this month we did better than last month and the month before. But they don't look long term to be able to see, is that level of performance actually where we want to be? Is the long term trend improvement or are we declining in our performance and, and what do we need to do in order to, to address that? Um, and then another collection issue that we have is the belief that, that gaps in the data are really not that big a deal. Uh, I often hear this when I'm dealing with outsourcers. So the data comes from a client system and the client has ceased to report the data without an ETA for when that gap will be cor corrected. Uh, and in outsourcers, oftentimes that's approached with, uh, with the attitude that, well, that's on the client. And if the client uh, wanted us to manage that, they, they would provide the data. Um, Sometimes the effort to, to close the gap and actually collect the data without the help of the client uh, might seem greater than the ROI uh, for collecting that data. And so we make the decision that we're just going to live with that situation. The problem with that is that that often means we're not managing whatever that metric was intended to measure. So, so if we were supposed to measure that and we expected to measure that and we're no longer able to, then there's a real danger that we won't manage that appropriately and that performance will lag and we won't be able to see that. And so oftentimes we need to come up with ways to capture the data when, when the client, whether that's an external client system or whether that's internally some support department that's, that's unable to present the data to us, can't give us the data that we need to manage the business. Now we have a, a poll here, James. So if, if you would uh, kindly launch that poll, um, the, the question I have for you is how regularly do your operations review all of the performance metrics, including those metrics that relate to key support processes or to cost performance? So, so we may often measure things that are KPIs of concern to the business, but how often do we measure some of those, uh, those other metrics as well? We think about all of the metrics that we need to, to gather. Um, how often are we reviewing those, those metrics and the performance on those metrics? And we'll just give you a moment to And I think it's okay if the uh, if the answer is I don't know, then then you are are not alone. There's quite often a lot of folks in in operations that uh, that may not know the answer to that question. All right, and end that one. Yeah. So if you could share the results with us, James. Looks like uh, so we so so it looks like monthly is uh, is is the cadence that we're reviewing metrics, um, and I I would say where I run into organizations that do have a regular review of all of the performance metrics that's uh, that's pretty often the cadence. Although I would also say that quite often I see quarterly, I see weekly. Um, in some cases never might be the answer, right? So we don't have a, a regular cadence. Uh, individuals review the performance of these metrics um, and they review the performance of the, the metrics on a case-by-case -case basis. So, um, so we might not have operations being fully knowledgeable about everything all the time. All right, um, well, let's continue. So, so some other issues that, that we have in data co collection. Um, failure to, to identify what data should be collected. Uh, so, so those using the data and those reporting the data do not always agree on what should be collected. Um, and, and sometimes the, the measures themselves are not actually reflecting what was intended to be, to be measured. Um, I'd say quite often I experience organizations that have not established a system of record. Uh, in other words, the source for the data that we will uh, report at the program level in order to understand whether or not we're getting better. Um, 
And there's a really easy way to check this if, if you're in operations. Just ask a number of people to report on a performance metric and see whether or not they all give you the same number. Quite often when I teach classes, uh, especially high performance management techniques or Six Sigma classes, we will ask people to bring data. Um, and if we have individuals who are in the same organization, they, although it's intended that they bring the same metrics, they, they quite often bring different results. And in discussion, it comes out that, well, one person pulled it from one system, one person pulled it from a different system, and those two systems don't, don't agree. So, uh, so we're really, really good practice to establish a system of record for the performance metrics so that everyone can agree on what's going on relative to, to performance. Um, and then finally, what performance metrics are required? Uh, so, so we would say we have a definite opinion about this within COPC. Uh, you can find the answer in exhibits one through three of our COPC CX standard. Uh, exhibit one really covers the, the key customer related process metrics. So those are the metrics uh, measuring things that are really processes that directly interface with the customers. Customers are impacted by directly. Uh, exhibit two is really about the key support uh, process metrics. So maybe those are things that, that customers are impacted by, but they don't necessarily directly see it. So for instance, workforce management, forecast accuracy, scheduling accuracy, right? Those are metrics that, that aren't necessarily things that customers would know about, but they're processes that, that still impact our ability to serve the customers. And so they impact the customers. Uh, and then in exhibit three, what I like to think of as output metrics, uh, which are really the customer experience metrics and the overall cost metrics. Um, you can find this list of, of metrics that we think are essential uh, at our, our website, www.copc.com. Um, you can download the standard uh, within the standard. The exhibits are all included and you can see the complete list of metrics that we think every business, uh, depending on which of these key customer related processes or types of transactions that they're handling, they should be measuring on an ongoing basis. Um, most centers really are only measuring a subset of metrics that they should, should regularly be reviewing. So quite often, uh, we're looking at some, some really basic stuff in operations. We're looking at AHT, we're looking at customer satisfaction, we may be looking at a quality metric, but we're not looking at things like utilization or occupancy or scheduling forecast accuracy or cost per transaction. And those are really essential pieces of information to have to know whether or not we're successful as a business. Uh, we also have a poll for this slide. So, uh, so James, if you would please launch this poll. So has your center established system of records for its KPIs? Uh, and maybe you have for all the metrics, you might have established systems of, of metrics for only some key metrics, or you might not have established this uh, in a widespread view uh, across the organization. So just have you established systems of records for your KPIs? Well, looks like we got a little bit of both. Yeah, so we've got a mix here. So, so we have one answer, yes, for all metrics and one uh, only for a few metrics. Um, and, and I'd say that that's, that's pretty uh, typical of, of what we see when we go into organizations, that we have established uh, systems of records for some metrics, um, but, but maybe not everything that, that we need to. Um, excellent, so thank you, James. <clears throat> All right, so that's, uh, that's really collected. Let's think about usable. So when we talk about usable, uh, what we're really talking about, and again, here's our friend table F or a subset of, of table F. Um, the questions we really need to ask ourselves are, are the targets clearly identified? If we have high performance benchmarks um, and, and those benchmarks should apply to the metric, is that what we used to set the targets? And we don't always set the targets at the benchmark, but we may set them with reference to the benchmark, depending on what we're trying to accomplish as a business. Uh, and then finally, is there enough data to trend? Uh, and again, so here we've got the targets. We've clearly identified those. Uh, we've got 12 months of data for two of the three metrics, but of course we have this gap. So this may present a problem in terms of the usability of the data. So it was a collection issue, but it may also cause us trouble in determining whether or not there's a trend of improvements in, in performance or, or whether or not there's some action that we need to take in order to try to improve performance. Uh, so common issues that we find in terms of trends and target setting, uh, there's a failure to ensure that targets are consistent with each other. 
So I'd say we have metrics that should be mathematically consistent. Uh, we'll talk about that in depth in, in just a moment. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, uh, but just where we think that there are metrics that should be correlated to each other, to the targets that we set, do they actually align? Uh, if we achieve performance in one, will that mean we're also achieving performance in the other metric that should be correlated to that? I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Um, we also oftentimes, I, I find we have a failure to set targets that drive high performance. So we may set targets that are really easy, setting the target for the convenience of the program and not really looking at what the impact is on the customer experience. Uh, I've had a client in the past, they're a, they're a program that deals with a, with a government agency um, and they set a, a target for on time to respond to customer inquiries of uh, 45 business days, 45 business days. That's a, an exceedingly long cycle time for something like a customer inquiry. And, uh, and you, you probably are not that surprised to learn that something like that actually drives a lot of repeat volume into the business, which in fact is what they experienced. They were always hitting their on time to respond metric, but in, in point of fact, it really caused them a lot of trouble uh, and drove a lot of excess cost into the business because they set a target that was much too easy. Um, targets which never change. So, so we're hitting a target and, and we don't really change the target. We're, we're happy that we're hitting it and we're glad to count that as meeting our requirements and we just never really consider whether that target should ever change. When you're regularly hitting a target and that target uh, is for a metric that really impacts uh, service or quality or cost or the, the customer experience, um, then you should really think about making that target harder to hit in order to drive continuous improvement in your organization. But quite often we find organizations don't actually do that. Um, and then the flip side of that coin, targets that change too often. Typically I experience that when I go to visit outsourcers. Uh, that's the beating the enterprise average. So you may be one vendor who's competing with a lot of other vendors for the client's business and across the client enterprise, uh, we report the enterprise average. And so typically individual vendors are trying to be better than that enterprise average uh, in order to be in the top half, which hopefully will lead the, the client to continue giving you business. Um, really great to want to continue to get business from the client and you should be looking at that. But what that means is that oftentimes you don't actually know the target for a given time period until after the period is ended. So we're trying to beat an average that changes every day of the month, and we don't know what the actual target is until the end of the month. Uh, a lot of programs don't really have a way of approaching that, and you should really think about what level do I need to set internally my target at in order to ensure that I will beat the enterprise average. Sometimes that, that really requires some analysis of historical performance to understand what's the trend, what do I think the enterprise trend is, and where do I need to set my hard target throughout the course of the month to ensure that I'll actually be able to beat that enterprise average. Um, the other problem we encounter is not enough data really to determine trends. So this is often seen as the year to date number, right? It's a roll up so we can see year to date attrition is X. Um, the problem with that is that doesn't actually let us know whether attrition is, is getting better or getting worse, right? So those year to date numbers oftentimes don't give us enough insight to be able to understand what's happening in the short term or even in the medium or long term. Um, this can also happen with annual processes, so employee satisfaction surveys, client satisfaction surveys, processes where we're only measuring maybe once per year. Um, and oftentimes that doesn't let us know, are we actually getting better? So there are some strategies to get around that, um, strategies like perhaps with employee satisfaction, only surveying a quarter of the population of employees, but doing that on a quarterly basis to see whether or not the same issues rise to the top each quarter. We can see whether or not we're making improvements based on, on that. So different ways in which we might take something that's an annual process and get more frequent data points in order to understand what the trend is. I said I was going to show you some examples of, uh, of mathematically consistent targets or inconsistent targets, what that really looks like in terms of target setting. Uh, so here's an example. This is guest services. This is comparing service level and abandonment rate. So does service level drive higher uh, abandonment rates as, as it drops? Uh, and you can see here in the scatter plot, the R squared value, which really illustrates the strength of the correlation. It's pretty high. So R squared uh, runs from zero to one. The, the closer it is to one, the more perfect the correlation is between the two things. So we think that that explains a lot of the movement 
uh, in the dependent variable. And you can see here, as service level drops, uh, abandonment rate goes up. So this is a pretty strong and pretty consistent pattern in this data. So for this particular client, they had two targets. They had, a, in their statement of work, they had a target for abandonment rate set at 5%. Um, they had a target for their service level of 80-30. 80% of the, the transactions answered within 30 seconds. Uh, but unfortunately, those two things are not consistent with each other. So if we actually draw the line from the abandonment rate of 5% over to where it intersects this trend line, we can really see in order to drive that 5% uh, abandonment rate, we really only need a service level of about 72%. Uh, and if we, are, if we are looking at a, a service level of 80%, we're really talking about driving abandonment at about 3.5%, a, a little less than 3.5%. And so those two targets are not really mathematically consistent with each other. Um, the implication for that is, is generally, we are probably over-serving in this particular instance, we could set a lower service level target and still keep abandonment below the 5% um, that's in our, our target. And that lower service level means that we might need to carry fewer staff, right? Uh, which means that there's a huge cost implication here. The other thing I'd point out in this, this data is we really want to understand, um, are we actually doing the right thing? And so when we do this type of analysis, we can see, well, lots and lots of data points here are well above the 80%, and in fact, above 90% or even above 95%. Uh, again, reflecting that we're driving cost into the business, and that's a, a lot higher than necessary to really preserve the customer experience at the levels that, that we've determined we, we want. To hey, Brent, I know we're 35 minutes past the hour, but just, yeah. I don't want to slow us down, but a quick question here. Sure. This is three months worth of data you're, you're, you're reflecting here. And yep. so this correlation, which is great, is this enough? And I, I mean, is it, you know, obviously this is a snapshot. You might be looking at an annual number as well to compare this to, but in this case, does three months give you enough? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think this was done at the daily level. So this is, this is every day for this right. three months. So that's 90 data points or roughly 90 data points. Right. Um, that really is enough to, to give you some indication of uh, whether or not there's a correlation. And as yeah. you can see, there really is. Right. Um, yeah. You might look at this over a longer time period or the other way that you could approach it is to look at it at the interval level where you have the service level and abandonment rate at the interval. That would give you a huge number of data points that would really let you understand whether or not there's correlation. And oftentimes when we do this analysis, we see things which we'll talk about in data integrity that make us suspect the integrity of the data because we're doing things like setting short abandonment rate uh, right. you know, thresholds and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, at, at 90 points of data, you really have enough data to, to determine kind of what's going on in the organization. Okay. Great. Um, I'll give you another example. So this is an example where we have targets that are not really correlated to each other. Um, so, so this next example is where there actually is pretty good correlation between the targets. So here we're looking at the customer reported issue resolution and the impact issue resolution has on overall customer satisfaction measured as top two box on a five point scale with a neutral midpoint. Uh, and again, you can see the R squared value here is really high. It's 0.88. So that's suggesting there's really strong correlation between these. Uh, our performance on issue resolution does explain quite a bit of our performance on overall customer satisfaction. Um, each dot represents a week's worth of, of performance. Uh, and we get a pretty good sample size of, of CSAT in a, in a given week for this particular uh, program. This was inbound phone hardware and software support. And it was the, the period from August of 2019 through July of, of 2020. So we have a target of 70% issue resolution. And if we look at that target and where that intersects the, the trend line, that is actually pretty close to the high performance benchmark target for cus overall customer SAT uh, of 85% top two box. So that's actually a pretty good target for, for this 70% issue resolution. And if we deliver on that, we'll actually deliver the customer satisfaction that we want. So these are, are targets that really are mathematically consistent. Uh, knowing that these targets are aligned, then we can, instead of spending a lot of time wondering whether or not we have the right targets, we know if we get to this level of performance, we'll be driving high CSAT. We can start identifying what are the reasons for this, uh, this poor uh, issue resolution, and we can really try to fix that. We can also look at this and say, okay, well, if we really want to be above 85%, maybe the best target to set for issue resolution is actually at 75%, because at 75% issue resolution, we don't have any kind of CSAT misses. Everything is always above 85% uh, top two box there. So again, thinking about targets and whether or not they're mathematically consistent, 
this type of analysis really lets us identify the right thing and then focus on the right issues, which are our issues around issue resolution to drive this overall customer sat. Um, so again, I have a poll here. Uh, I'd really like to, to ask you, um, have, has your organization undertaken this sort of analysis to identify targets which really should be linked together? So we think that there are multiple metrics uh, that should be linked. Has, has your organization actually done this sort of analysis to figure out if your targets are aligned for those linked metrics? And again, I, I probably, uh, you know, some of you may be thinking, no, this is an entirely new concept for me. That's perfectly fine. Um, many organizations aren't really thinking about it in, in this way. Uh, and as a result, don't necessarily know whether or not their metrics are, are actually aligned with each other. Give it another moment. If anybody else wants to vote there. Uh, this is pretty typical as well. So yes, but only for some metrics. So for a lot of the organizations that, that we've done, uh, you know, a lot of work with, uh, this is a concept that is familiar. And so those organizations will have at least looked at things like service level and abandonment. Uh, there are other pairs of metrics that you could look at, utilization and cost per transaction, service level and occupancy, uh, recruiting quality and attrition, especially early attrition. Those are things where you should be thinking about, you know, do I have the right targets set to drive the level of, of performance that I, uh, that I think should exist in the dependent variable. Uh, and so this is a really great way of looking at, at whether or not you set the right targets. Uh, data integrity. So uh, again, I said here, we want the, the data to, to roar. So, uh, so we've gone over this a bit. Really, this is all about, can we rely on the data so, uh, so what performance metrics are required? Are we measuring the right stuff? Um, if sample data is used, are we collecting the data in a way that, that is unbiased? So we don't wanna make, you know, we wanna make sure we're not cherry picking the data uh, in a way that misleads the organization into thinking it's doing better than, than it really is. Um, accuracy, is the data calculated correctly? Is it presented in a clear way? It's not misleading. Uh, and does it reflect the full results, right? Do we get a good picture of what's happening in the population? Um, common integrity issues that we run into, incorrect calculations, and this happens a lot. So, uh, so I see this, I, I won't say I see it in every program that I go to, but I see it in a significant percentage of programs. You wanna make sure you check your spreadsheet formulas and that, and that the formulas in those spreadsheets are correct and they're calculating the things the way you want them to be calculated. I run into this problem a lot. Um, you wanna check your systems settings uh, and also ensure well-meaning but poorly informed staff are not making changes which prevent uh, understanding what's actually happening. And, and I would say the, the best example of that that I've found is, uh, is with this whole idea of the correlation between service level and abandonment rate quite often someone says, oh, I know how to make abandonment rate look a lot better, right? This is, this is not, I'm just gonna change the setting in the switch and we're going, going to exclude any abandons that occurred before X amount of time. Right. And now suddenly our abandonment rate looks great, right? We've excluded all those short abandons. Um, I, maybe the most egregious case of that, I went to an organization and they had a short abandon threshold of 30 seconds, which also happened to be their service level threshold uh, oh. that they were trying to, to impact. And so when you looked at the correlation between abandonment rate and service level, there, there really was not an R squared value was really, really low. Um, it wasn't done maliciously. It wasn't people that were trying to hide the level of performance, but it was people that really didn't understand what they should be reporting and they didn't understand the inherent relationship. And as a result, someone had made the change somewhere down the line and no one had ever looked at it to see, is this really what we're trying to measure? And is, is this the way we want to calculate it? So, um, so that happens quite a bit. Um, using the sample when the poll population is available, and I, I run into this, I won't say it's common, but I run into this from time to time. Uh, organizations that decide to sample AHT or sample conversion rate instead of just measuring it. AHT is available to us in the switch. We can measure it directly. We have all of the transactions and we know what the average handle time is. Uh, we should, that's not something we should sample. So, so you have to ask yourself that question is, are, are we sampling things that we really should be measuring 
the full population of, of results. Sampling is a great tool, uh, but it is a tool and it's a tool that's intended to remove costs from the business. Um, there's not really a cost associated with measuring the full AHT results. Uh, there might be a cost associated with trying to monitor every single transaction. So sampling and quality is something we'd expect to see. Sampling of AHT is not something we would expect to see. Um, and then I'd, I'd say integrity issues, ignoring the margin of error. So thinking that the movement of one or two percentage points in a metric uh, that's based on samples is meaningful when the margin of error is really, really large. So that's thinking the change from here to here is really, really meaningful. But then when we go and we calculate the margin of error, the margin of error is really, really huge. And so that minuscule movement that we're looking at doesn't really represent much confidence that we've actually improved or are getting worse. Uh, and I find organizations quite often are, are doing this when they're looking at CSAT data. Uh, they see a movement of 1% or 1.5% and suddenly everyone's hair is on fire. Everybody's trying to take action and you know, make a change in CSAT. And oftentimes that's just statistical noise. It doesn't really represent anything meaningful in terms of the level of performance of the business. So, so understanding the margin of error when, when we say we wanna make sure that, that we understand um, the statistical implications of, of the sample size, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, this example is really looking at, at whether or not the data is accurate. So do we think this data has in integrity? So again, this is service level and abandonment rate. Uh, we said these things should inherently have a, a correlation to each other, and typically that correlation is really strong, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, R-squared value. Um, you can already see here in this, uh, in this graph, the R-squared value is pretty low for this pair of metrics at 0.35. That's suggesting that there's really not a correlation between these two things. Uh, and the reason when you look into the data it starts to become obvious. So we have these outlier data points uh, that are really an issue. So uh, here in March, we had a 73% service level with a 3% abandonment rate. But if you look over here in September, uh, it was about a 3% abandonment rate and our service level was much better at, at 84%. Uh, same thing with December. If we look at that low service level and low abandonment rate, but we also have high service level where we have low abandonment rate. Uh, and so those things don't really make sense. If we are not serving customers, we would expect the abandonment rate to go up. Um, this would be an indication that we've got an integrity issue with this pair of metrics. Now, if we were to scrub these data points and just look at the, the remaining data points, uh, the targets here are pretty consistent with each other. So our abandonment rate target of 4%, uh, if we drop that down to service level, really kind of zeroes in on this 80% and 30 seconds target that we've set for service level. Uh, but if you're looking at your own data, Cleaning up these anomalies might actually break this relationship, right? They, they might actually suggest a, a different uh, target. So just be aware of that as something that you'll have to consider when you're looking at the integrity of the data. If you have to clean some stuff up, that may make you change your mind about some of the targets that you've set. Um, bias data, that happens surprisingly often. Cherry picking of, of samples, whether that's intentional or unintentional. Uh, I find this most often monitoring transactions that are near the average handle time. Quality department thinks that that's the way they're going to get all of the, the evaluations done that they need to get done. Uh, only surveying customers who made a purchase for their satisfaction, therefore missing out on all those people who didn't make a purchase and maybe understanding why they didn't make a purchase. Uh, placing survey collection in the hands of agents is never a good idea, uh, but I find that happens quite a bit. So the agents are responsible for sending the survey to the customer. Uh, you can be guaranteed that if the agent knows that customer is really, really unhappy, there is a strong likelihood that customer is never going to get a survey if it's in the hands of the agent to, to deliver the, the survey. Um, and then maybe a really important aspect of this, poor calibration. Uh, and again, quality systems, here's where calibration is very, very important. So uh, having quality systems that don't quantitatively assess calibration to make sure the individuals who are putting data into the system are all scoring things the same way. Um, the drawback to that is, is that if they're scoring things very differently, the data becomes pretty useless in terms of trying to analyze it to, to identify process level issues or root causes of, of poor performance. Um, and, and also poor calibration to customer requirements. Uh, so oftentimes I, I see organizations that are uh, trying to predict what customer satisfaction will be by putting some kind of writer on the quality form and internally we're assessing whether or not the customer was happy 
and not necessarily paying attention to what the customer says. Uh, the reason why this is a problem, and this seems to be true in survey after survey that, that we do. Uh, so these are the results from COPC's Corporate and Consumer Insights Survey from 2018. Uh, the question we asked is, do you feel the customer care organization uh, is generally meeting the needs and expectations of the customers? Uh, corporate results, companies all over said, yeah, we're doing a great job. We're at 88% of, of the company said, we, we're really meeting customer requirements. Uh, but measuring what customers had to say, uh, the consumers really only were at about 40%. So 40% of them said, yeah, you're, you're doing a good job. That's a real disconnect. And so we need to understand, are we calibrated with what customer requirements are? And are we meeting the, the needs of our, our customers? Um, K, so for known, is the data known and understood by appropriate staff? Questions you got to ask yourself here are, who's, who's actually receiving performance data on a regular result? Not everybody needs to know everything, but do the people who need to know this data, do they actually know that? Um, and do they understand the results? So who should be knowledgeable of the data? Uh, and if people, if we're dealing with sample data, do the people who, who are responsible for that, do they actually know the margin of error that's associated with that? Do they know the degree of uncertainty about that, that result? Um, you cannot know this stuff unless you have conversations that matter. So that means going out and actually identifying in your operations. Uh, are people aware of performance? When they say things like we improve, uh, when you go and look at the data, does that, that actually show that, that level of improvement? Um, ask people, regularly review performance with the staff, ask them questions, find out what they know about performance, what they know about the data, what they know about how the results were, were calculated. Um, observe people making decisions based on, on data. Are they making decisions based on verifiable data? Or are they making decisions based on assumptions? Have you individually, have you verified the data? And then check people's skills, verify that they know what they need to know and they're able to use the data appropriately. So again, I have a poll here, just a quick question, James, if you would. So how often does your organization formally audit processes or assess the knowledge and skills of its staff? So how often do you go out and actually see how well people are utilizing the data and how well they're able to make decisions based on that data. So regularly, at least quarterly, at least annually, uh, we might do it for some processes if we think there's a problem uh, or maybe I don't know or I can't remember the last time we did this. Okay, so, so at least annually, uh, we, we might have some, some irregular uh, measurement of some processes, depending if we think there's a, a problem. This is a really good practice, and, and I would say you really ought to be doing this at least annually, uh, going out and reviewing with people and asking questions and formally auditing whether or not people really know what they need to know in order to be able to, to manage the processes they're responsible for. Uh, finally, the last, uh, the A for actions, we take actions all the time. Uh, we really need to let the data tell us whether or not we're having the correct actions, taking action when we need to. So the two things we really want to consider for actions, are we meeting the targets? And we think you should be meeting the targets regularly. Regularly for COPC means at least three quarters of the time periods we're hitting the target that we've set for the data. So if we're looking at 12 months of data, did we hit the target at least nine months out of, out of 12? Um, where we're not hitting the target, the other thing that we want to look at to see whether or not we're taking action is, do we have sustained improvement, right? So we define sustained improvement as the last three data points, uh, each one of those individually, better than the average of the previous three consecutive data points. So it really means looking at the last six months, figuring out what that, that previous performance level was of the first three months of that data, the average performance, and then seeing if each of the last three months is better than that average. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. So here's why it's a, it's a, a problem. It's a common problem that we encounter. Uh, we take a lot of action in, in our centers. We take a lot of action in our operations. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when we make a decision to take action, we start monitoring our progress. And when we hit the target, we say, yay, we hit the target and we move on to whatever the next fire is. And we try and put out that, that next fire. And we oftentimes don't monitor this to see whether or not that level of improvement is sustained over time. We really need to know this. So in this example, uh, our average in our, our previous performance level is 71%. 
yeah, we hit the target, but then we started sliding. And when we reach this point out here in the 12th month, we're below this 71% average. That's really a danger sign that whatever actions we took, if they were in fact responsible for the improvement, either we've stopped doing those actions or there's some other incident or some other problem in the process that's caused us to lose performance. Um, if we're not looking at this sustained Im improvement and trying to make sure that we are maintaining the level of performance over time, we're gonna be in this boat quite often. So we're gonna see we're unable to consistently hit the, hit the performance. Uh, another example here of taking action and, and, and trying to understand what's really going on. This situation comes up quite a bit when dealing with programs that are measuring the, the delta from the target as their indicator of whether they're improving or not. So, so how far away we are from the, the target line. Um, and in this particular, this is real world data, in this particular organization, uh, they had a static target for quite a while and they made a decision in December to change that target and, and base the target on historical data, which is not necessarily what you wanna do. Uh, if your historical performance has been bad, you don't necessarily wanna set a target based on that bad performance. Um, but again, they were measuring their delta from the target. And so you can see they're quite far away each of these months when we had a static target and then we changed the target and now we're much closer to the target, but the level of performance didn't actually change. This is absenteeism. They're still in double digit absenteeism every month, uh, sometimes quite high. Uh, you can see in this line of business actually going up in the last four months uh, and really peaking at about 25%. That's huge levels of absenteeism. This organization thought they were getting better because they were measuring the delta from the target instead of looking overall at what the trend was uh, and whether or not they were consistently able to drive performance to, to better levels of, of performance. So internal performance, uh, internal reporting gave them the illusion that they were actually getting a lot better when in fact they were really, really static. Uh, again, a real drawback here. So some common action issues, uh, only thinking about persistent problems in the short term. It got better this day or week or month, therefore we fixed it. Um, you, really, you really need to look over the longer term to be able to understand. Believing coaching is the solution to most operational problems. This is endemic to almost every program I go to. So the idea is we, we look at the performance, but then who do we have to go coach to make things improve? About 75% of your performance issues are going to stem from systemic issues or from process level issues, processes that are broken or unclear or maybe not optimal. Uh, and so coaching might bring you some temporary relief, but it's not able to sustain the level of improvement that you need. You have to go fix the process. Um, and then concentrating on easy fixes rather than impactful fixes. Uh, in general, not having a prioritization approach to identify the thing that is most impactful and fixing that. Uh, not having a structured improvement methodology. So you know, not having a, a method that defines the problem, analyzes data, implements solutions, and then monitors the results to see whether or not we've got, gotten better. Uh, typically, what I see is that we assume what the root cause is. We don't actually confirm that with data. Uh, and then we come up with the solution, which is also assumed, uh, and we don't really identify whether or not we're addressing a true root cause. Um, and then finally, most importantly for outsourcers, confusing enterprise improvement for improvement that stemmed from actions we took locally within the site. So what that means is the enterprise overall got better. We think we got better because we took action, but we're not really comparing the local site to the enterprise to see the improvement we experienced was really because everyone in the enterprise was improving because of some change in the mix of transactions. Really, really important. Um, that's really QCA in a nutshell in a, in a short amount of time. I think that was about 50 minutes. Uh, I had hoped to make it a little shorter than that, but, uh, but that's QCA in a nutshell. And it's really a practice that you need to have in place in your organization. How does that fit into, uh, into COPC and what we do at COPC? So, so you've made a good start here on, uh, on data mastery and understanding data. So that was this QCA webinar and understanding you know, what QCA is so that you can implement that in your, in your operations. Uh, we have a short training, a two-day training on data analysis in contact centers. It's coming up October 20th and 21st. Uh, if you're at all interested in making more progress along the lines of understanding data, understanding how to manipulate that data and identify what your, what your issues are. Uh, this is a great place to start. I highly recommend signing up for that. We also have Yellow Belt training, Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt training. Uh, we just had a, a public class last week. I don't think we have on the calendar 
uh, our public classes for 2021, but I'm sure that's coming soon. So yes. keep an eye on that if you're interested in Six Sigma training. Uh, I love that class. I train yellow belt and green belt. Uh, and we also do some mentoring and project leadership as, as well. So we love to engage with organizations on helping them improve. Uh, and we'd love to be able to, to help your organization get better in terms of how it handles data and identifies root causes. I know we're right back to the top of the hour. Uh, if people want to stick for just a few minutes, uh, we may have some questions. Uh, I'll defer to you, James, if we have any questions that, that people have, uh, have submitted during the course of this. Yeah, we, we have a couple, um, and uh, I think we have time at least to do one here. Uh, first one, I think uh, probably the best one here in terms of uh, importance to the session was, what methodology should we use for our problem-solving approach? Does COPP have a recommendation methodology? Yeah, yeah, great question, great question. So, um, so what do we recommend? We love Six Sigma's DMAIC methodology primarily because it aligns with what COPC is trying to accomplish. Uh, but any improvement methodology, as long as it does those things that we mentioned, it defines the problem, uh, it measures and analyzes data to identify the root causes, um, it, it uh, comes up with some sort of solution to address those root causes and implements those solutions, and then it monitors the results in order to determine whether or not the solution had the impact that it should have had, and that we control that and maintain that result over time. Um, as long as it does those things, we, we don't think that, that there's, uh, there's any one methodology that's, that's the best. They just, they just need to, to have those steps. The MAIC accomplishes all of those, but there are other, there are other methodologies, PAIR, um, you know, do, check, act. Um, those, are, those are all methodologies that, that could be successful. Um, but you want to have a structured approach. You want to make sure that you have a structured approach and that you have people who are trained in that approach so they know how to deploy that. One of the biggest drawbacks I see is organizations tell me, we use DMAIC, we're using Six Sigma. And when I go, what I actually see is they have a form that has DMAIC spelled out. But what they're really doing is they're just coaching. So here's our problem. We coach to it. Um, if that didn't work, we're going to coach harder. That's our control plan. And you know they look at data and they've got one data point that got better. They say, see, we fixed the problem. They're not actually deploying to make. So you wanna make sure people understand the approach that you select, that it does the things that it needs to do and that you're having meaningful performance improvement as a result. Brent, uh, we got another one here. I think it's important to, to ask as well. Um, how, sus how does sustained improvement, how sustained improvement can be measured for metrics with variable targets? i.e. different targets each month for cost or sales metrics? Yeah, that's a, that's a bit tough. Um, yeah. So, so we would say, first of all, that, that variable, met, variable targets are really a difficult thing to manage to. Uh, if you can at all figure out how to set a more static target. And, and again, if you're in competition with other vendors, you're an outsourcer, uh, one way would be to look at top quartile uh, performance among all the other vendors to try and, and set a, a target based on that. That's then static across three months or six months before you, you make a change. Um, but generally speaking, if, you, if you're stuck with, with targets that change on a monthly basis, then you really are looking at the, the delta to the target and whether or not that delta is going in the right direction. So if you're, if you're lower than the, the target and that's a bad thing, are we getting closer to the target? If you're over the target uh, and, and being you know, up is good, uh, is, is that delta increasing if we're over the target? Um, understanding the delta to the target is really important. Just the caveat there is if you make changes to, to your target over time in terms of what the delta is that you're trying to, to, to get to um, or what the target itself is, uh, just make sure you understand the implications of that so you don't run into a situation where you change the target and it gives you the illusion you've gotten better when in fact performance is not better.